Thank you, music team, for leading us in worship and for exalting Christ. Indeed, hallelujah, what a Savior. That is one of my favorite hymns. Early on in my spiritual life, I was not raised singing hymns, and so when I started paying attention to the words of the hymns that we sang, my mind was just blown away by how the Lord uses writers to compose the music that we can sing songs to and agree with in praise. And what a joy that is for us to be able to do that on a regular basis every Sunday morning and every day of the week uh, to sing the praises of God Most High. I don't know if you know this or if you haven't thought about it in a while, but hallelujah is actually a command in the Hebrew. It is to praise the Lord. Um, Actually, leave off the two. It is praise the Lord. It is a command that we do. So every time we sing hallelujah, we are praising God. And what a joy, again, for us to be able to do that. I'm so thankful this morning that we have the opportunity to go before the Lord's table But before we go there, I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 15. I was really tempted a couple weeks back to want to continue Gabe's message in John chapter 4, but you don't ever want to do that as a preacher, Um, take on the next passage of the previous preacher. You want to let him really enjoy that time uh, in the Word, And, and I'm Really looking forward to the time when Gabe comes back next week and can continue in that passage. Uh, But this morning, my mind was focused on this idea, once again, of true worshipers. And uh, Psalm 15 is going to be our focus for this morning. Before we go to the text, though, I want to begin by saying that, once again, it is a joy for me to be here in front of you. Um, I just want to let you know I am not sick this time. I think the last time that I was here, I had COVID. I am not sick, so my mind is fixed on the text a little bit more um, this morning. But the reason why I've selected this text, this psalm, is because lately I've been reminded of how important it is not to take for granted the joy we have in coming together to worship God on Sunday morning. Too often, people take for granted this opportunity. It shouldn't be that way. What is more disconcerting to me, though, is that many look to the church as a place to come and have their needs met. They fail to recognize that the primary purpose for which the church exists is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen? So rather than focusing one's attention on God, many come with the inclination to focus on self. That is the wrong perspective that we should have in regards to this moment, this time. In a sense, the church at large has promoted a system of self-works or works righteousness rather than recognizing that we come here to engage in a saving relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. And I believe for many of those wrong reasons, whether they are intentional or not, we have forgotten what true worship really is. It is about the Lord. It is about recognizing our need for a sufficient Savior and glorifying Him for all the good things that He has done. Well, if someone were to ask you this morning, why is church so important to you? My hope would be that your answer would be it's because of Jesus Christ. It is because we are here to glorify God. It is because life is, And ministry is about the person of God himself. It is about our need to come to him on his terms rather than our own. Well, as I've been thinking about my own response to worship the Lord, here in this place, Psalm 15 immediately comes to mind. The reason why is because 
This is the question that the psalmist asks of himself. The question is, who can come to God? What are the spiritual conditions required for the true worshiper to come to God on his terms? And how can a person come to God knowing that as a sinner, every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God? Well, I believe that Psalm 15 is one of those psalms that can really help us to recapture what is a a correct biblical understanding of what it means to come to God and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And especially as a sincere believer who has a genuine desire to glorify God with his or her life. Well, today I want to take a moment and have the Scriptures remind us of what a, a true worshiper really is. And in order to do that, I want us to look at what King David wrote here in Psalm 15. Lord willing, before we turn our attention to the Lord's table, we will be encouraged to examine our own lives in, what, in the context of what Scripture tells us a true worshiper ought to be. And for our time this morning, I want us to look at just three aspects of this beautiful song together as a very simple outline of what the psalmist has composed, I want us to look first at the plea of the true worshiper in verse 1. I then want us to focus our attention on the portrait of the worshiper in verses 2 through 5. And then finally, I want us to just take in the promise of the true worshiper or the, or the promise to the true worshiper in the last part of verse 5. Just five Simple verses, but a psalm that is jam-packed with such profound spiritual truth relevant to our lives, even though it was composed so long ago. Well, as we look at this psalm together, let me begin by saying that most of us are probably familiar with the many of the events of the writer himself, King David. It's possible that many of us know enough about David that given the circumstances of his life, we would be familiar with the events surrounding the writing and composing of this psalm that he has written. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, Yahweh made this declaration concerning King David, that as the next chosen leader of the people of Israel, David was to be or was a man after what? God's own heart. In other words, he was a man committed to the Lord. And what is true about David is that he sought to glorify God with all of his life. The reason we know this is true is because from a very early age, God gave David a heart to value those things that which the Lord had revealed about himself. He took seriously the word of God. And truth be told, he was a man committed to glorifying God with every intention of his heart. That despite his own sinful failures, he was a man who knew the Lord and wanted to glorify Him with all of his life. Well, not only do we see this in the events surrounding King David's life, and especially as they're recorded for us in the book of Samuel Kings and Chronicles, but we also see them in many of the Psalms that are attributed to his name. Again, David was a man after God's own heart. That God was gloriously lifted high in David's praise and adoration of him. And yet, despite his own weaknesses, his own failures, his own gross sins, he knew that his own worship was woefully inadequate to express the true intentions of his heart. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that so many of us love the book of Psalms. Why? Because out of David's own personal experiences, out of his own failures, his own temptations, his own 
desires. He captures for us what it means to have a man who li- wants to live a life wholly devoted to him, but understanding he falls woefully short. Because of his own sinful tendencies, he questions his own inadequacies before God. And that is why we appreciate so many of the Psalms that he has written. It is because his experiences become our experiences. And the same man who then questions God shows us where we need to go to find the answers that we need to live a life wholly devoted to him, to God himself. Well, likewise, his prayers become our prayers. His praises become our praises. And this is why I believe God has given us the book of Psalms so that we can know the truth about God through the experiences of godly men. Well, as you know, David is a man who failed miserably before the Lord. Yet he is also portrayed as a man who had a confident faith in God. He put his trust in a trustworthy God. And for this reason, he was a man who had a heart after God's own heart. He was a true worshiper of God, as reflected in the psalm before us. But again, before we look at the details of what David has written, I want us to get another sense of who David was. A man who desired to glorify God with all of his life. At the heart of Psalm 15 is this desire to live openly, transparently before God to demonstrate with every aspect of one's life a commitment to glorify God by living obedient to His Word. This is what it means to have a heart after God's own heart. David is just one example to us of a man who desired to worship God in both spirit and in truth. And we can see by the example that he sets before us that his desire is what saturates the psalms that he has written. Now keep in mind, out of 150 psalms that we have in the book of Psalms, 73 of them were written by King David. Not only was David instrumental in leading God's people to worship, his worship was born out of a desire to glorify God by living obedient to his word. And as you read every one of the Psalms, you can trace that back to the word of God and see how he wanted to live and apply the truth of God to his life. Now, there is no way that we can adequately convey the extent of David's desire But as he is written in Psalms, like Psalm 16, verses 1 and 2, we get a sense of what his desire truly was. David writes, Keep me, O God, for I take refuge in you. O my soul, you have said to Yahweh, You are my Lord, I have no good without you. David knew that Only that which is truly good could come from the Lord. Why? Because he is the one who alone is good. And he reminds himself to take refuge in God alone. Because only that which is truly good comes from God. And where else would we seek our refuge? Yet he was also a man who knew his own wayward temptations and tendencies. Psalm 19, verses 13 and 14, David writes, Keep back your slave from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Why? Because then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. Such devotion, such desire David had for the blamelessness of God that it would be applied to him. Then Psalm 26, verse 2, Test me, O Yahweh, and try me. Refine my heart and my mind. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. 
Let me ask you, when's the last time that you've prayed that for yourself? Again, David was a man who desired to live open, to live transparent before the Lord. And he knew that the only way that he could be declared righteous before God is if God himself then justified him freely from his sin. And this is exactly what God had done for David. And David knew this. He knew it. In fact, David had such a confident faith in the Lord that when it came time for him to die and to stand freely and openly before the Lord, the creator of the universe, he knew that he would be counted righteous before God because of what God had done for him. How do we know this? Psalm 17, 15 says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Do you realize that that same promise that David had is the same assurance and promise that we have? King David had such a confidence in the promises of God that like many of us today, he knew enough about his Redeemer that when he died, he would stand and be glorified with him. Again, the reason David was portrayed as a man after God's own heart is because David understood the imputed righteousness of God himself. He understood that God's righteousness must be credited to his account. And he understood this because he understood the significance of God's own holiness. And this is what Psalm 15 is all about. It is about being captivated with the transcendency of God. It is being captivated with the understanding of what true worship is and who the true worshiper must be. And this is what David's desire was for his own life. As David expresses it in Psalm 27, verse 4, it is to behold the beauty of Yahweh himself and to inquire at his temple. And here in this psalm, David is asking the question, who or how must we truly live in order to enjoy the fullness of our fellowship with God? How must the righteousness of God be reflected in us when we come to him? We can only know that we are then truly worshiping God in spirit and in truth. In other words, God, who are the true worshipers? And the answer is quite simple. Those who have a desire for God, those who have a life that reflects his life, and those who seek to glorify God above everything else. The promise from God is this, that those who are transformed to live this way, they will never be shaken, never be shaken. It's the same benediction we find that, the, that Jude writes in his epistle, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in his presence, in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. That is essentially what David is writing here in Psalm 15. And David knew this. Again, Psalm 15 is a very simple psalm. It's short. It's only five verses. We could memorize it and know it. And I challenge you to do that. It's easy for us to read. It's easy for us to understand structurally. It's easy to essentially see what David is asking because he's posing a question in the first part of this psalm. He then gives an answer. And like so many of his other psalms, David ends with a promise, a promise that is full of great joy and great security. Well, in verse 1, David begins with a passionate plea before God. He then answers that plea by giving us a portrait of the only person who can truly come before God. And then, like I said, the psalm ends with a promise that is meant to strengthen the true worshiper's faith. This morning, I want us to spend the majority of our time on that portrait. I want us to spend the majority of our time on verses 2 through 5. And the reason is, is because if instead of going through a, just a list of representative qualities here in this verse, I want us to focus on just three broad categories that have to do primarily with our conduct in verses 2 and 3, our company in verse 4, and finally our currency in verse 5. 
And at the center of this psalm, this is where we are going to spend the majority of our time this morning. Well, let's begin by reading the psalm. And I'm going to read this for you. And then we will focus on the details of this psalm. Psalm 15, a psalm of David. O Yahweh, who may sojourn in your tent? Who may dwell in your holy mountain? He who walks blamelessly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear Yahweh. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. Amen? What a wonderful psalm. Well, let's begin first with David's passionate plea. And here I want to focus on just two simple observations. First, the poem, and then the petition. Now, you're going to notice that I like to use alliteration. Um, I do that primarily because it helps me to think through the passage, but hopefully it'll help you to have little guardrails or, or little hooks to sink into as we work our way through this psalm. But first of all, let's focus on the poem and then the petition. And this comes under the plea for a true worshiper. Under point number one, the plea of a true worshiper, we have this poem. Keep in mind that when we read the Psalms, there's one thing we must never neglect to remember. And that's the title of the poem, the title of the Psalm. The reason that we don't want to neglect the title is because sometimes that title helps us to have an anchor to know when this psalm was written or by who. We know that that psalm title is part of the inspired text. When the text begins with the psalm of David, keep in mind that that information is actually part of the inspired text. In fact, in the original Hebrew, that title is included in verse 1. So verse 1 actually begins with a psalm of David. This is important because it tells us not only what kind of psalm this is or song this is, but actually who wrote it. And here we're told specifically that this is a psalm written by David himself, the one who became king over all Israel in place of Saul. Now, why a psalm? Because essentially, this is a song that is written to be accompanied with string instruments. It is a song to be sung. It is a worship song. And again, more than likely, it was a song that David had written after a very important event in his life. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. This shouldn't be too surprising to us, given that many of the Psalms and hymns that we sing today were written after important events had incurred, had occurred in the life of their authors. But here we're reminded that David is the one who is now setting the pattern for us for what worship is. He wrote this psalm essentially as a poetic psalm of praise, and for David it was intended to be sung as a praise to God. And it was a song to be sung by all of Israel in praise to God. He wrote it as an answer to one of the most important questions that anyone could ever ask of God. God, who of any of us could approach you? Who of any of us can come before you? Who of any of us can dwell in security and safety with you? Now, unlike some of the other songs that David had written, we have no idea of the specific circumstances under which David had written this psalm. What we do know is that David questioned and that David's question and answer is something that applies to every single one of us. That those who come must be approved by God himself. We can't come and approve ourselves. Well, obviously, based on the language that's being used here, David himself was now perplexed over the question that he then questions God. God, how can I come before you? How can I dwell in security and safety with you? And perhaps given the circumstances behind this psalm, David recognized at a particular moment how unworthy 
he was. Well, like I said, this song has application to every single one of us sitting here this morning. Why? Because this song helps us to understand who the qualified person is. The one who can truly approach God, dwell with him, and rest securely in his presence. That like David, we must be one who has a heart after God. And that is what is ultimately required. The point of David's poem and petition is, is that it's not about where we go to worship as much as it is who we are able to worship and to worship God on his terms. That is the question that David posits for us this morning. And let me remind ourselves that, and especially as we approach the Lord's table this morning, before we ever think about where to worship, true worship is something that begins with a person and not with a place. Before we ever come to worship, the question should be, are we even approved to be the true worshipers that God demands and requires? And this is because the question that we really need to ask ourselves is, is our heart, is our life even right before the Lord? This brings us to David's petition. I want you to notice that in the very first part of of Uh, Verse 1 here of Psalm 15, David begins this song with a double interrogative. He asks two questions that essentially address the same issue. Who is able to live in God's house and who is really worthy to come and dwell with God? The two phrases here that David writes to abide or sojourn in his tent and to dwell on his holy mountain, obviously have special reference to the place where God's presence dwelt. They pointed the worshiper to a place where God's presence was being manifest. But here's the catch. Before David's time, God's presence wasn't always in the same place. In fact, for over 300 years, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant had been located in Shiloh, not there in Jerusalem. Now, David, during David's reign, it was being moved from Shiloh to then Mount Moriah, where it would take its place and a house would be built for God. Mount Moriah, as you remember, is the place where Abraham was going to offer his son Isaac and God intervened. It was the place, that place in Jerusalem where David ultimately brought the tabernacle of God. And it was the tabernacle itself that represented God's presence with his people Israel. It was in that tent that God's holiness was then made visible to all. And at the time, and only during one time of the year could even the high priest himself enter into the Holy of Holies. And yet here David is asking the question, who, aside from the high priest, would ever be qualified to come and to live in God's presence forever? That question is at the heart of David's greatest concern. God, who am I to approach your holy hill? Who am I to come and dwell in your presence? Who am I to truly worship you in spirit and in truth? How can I be approved to live in God's presence? As sinful as I am, what kind of life qualifies me to abide in your presence even for a millisecond? Well, again, keep in mind that as a believing Jew, the references here to God's tent God's holy mountain would have immediately brought to mind the place where the tabernacle was now located or going to be located. But again, even more important than the place, David's question really is, who am I, God, to come to you? To come to you? And that's the question that is at the heart of David's plea before the Lord. As you think about that question from David, that plea ought to bring to mind a very significant incident that happened around the time that David wrote this psalm. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, David was in the process of bringing the Ark of the Covenant over from the house of Abinadab to Mount Moriah. 
After the ark had been returned by the Philistines, it ended up in the house of Abinadab. And now David was celebrating the return of the ark and all the people of Israel with him. However, according to Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, and Exodus 25, 14, David violated God's explicit commands and instructions on how to transport that ark. He did exactly what God had told him not to do. And as a result, God brought down judgment on that very moment. If you remember, they were bringing the ark up to Jerusalem by way of a cart. And in order to steady the cart, Uzzah, Abinadab's son, reached out to steady that ark. The text tells us very dramatically that God's anger burned against him. And at that moment, God struck down Uzzah and he died on the spot. As shocking as that moment was when it happened, the text tells us that David, David became angry at the Lord's outburst. Can you imagine? What a juxtaposition. God's judgment in contrast to David's outburst. Likewise, David should have been put to death right on the spot. However, despite his own anger, the text goes on to tell us that David was afraid of the Lord that day. An overwhelming sense of a holy fear came over David and it paralyzed him spiritually. Well, what happened next? Because of that incident, both Uzzah's death and David's outburst, the ark then ended up spending the next three months at the house of Obed-Edom. I can't imagine what would have come over the mind of Obed-Edom to have the ark at his house after those two incidences happened. But for three months, the text tells us that David contemplated God's judgment. After those three months, David finally got the instructions right. I'm sure his mind was saturated with Old Testament law, saturated with scripture to understand where did I go wrong? What did I do wrong? It's not about me. It's not about you, David. It's about God. And after those three months, he got the instructions right. The priests came, and according to God's own explicit instructions, they carried the ark up to Mount Zion, where it was then placed inside the tabernacle to then begin worship. And since no one knows exactly when this psalm was written, many scholars have concluded that this was the event that surrounds the writing of this particular psalm, that this is what was instrumental in causing David to write down the words that we now have read in this psalm. That incident posed a very serious question in David's mind. After such holiness and judgment were put on display, O God, who then can come and dwell in your presence? Who has the right to even walk up the mountain, let alone to come to your presence? In other words, before we ever ascend to the place where God's holiness dwells, who can be made qualified and approved to worship you? The answer comes to us in verses 2 through 5. Here is the person who is truly worthy to worship God. He is the person who is qualified to abide in God's presence. And it all boils down to these three categories. Number one, it's the person whose conduct reflects the holiness and righteousness of God himself. Number two, who keeps company with those who fear the Lord. And number three, who has a right approach regarding his resources, who gives back to God that which belongs only to him. It's his conduct, his company, his currency, that is reflected in who he is that makes the man approved before God. And again, this is all because of God, not because of us. 
This is the person who truly is spiritually qualified to worship God. Well, this moves us from the plea of the true worshiper to the portrait of the true worshiper in verses two through five. And the principle here is that true worship not only involves how one handles his own life practically, but it's reflected in one's approach to others and how we then handle our resources and steward the things that God has given us. In other words, whose life is lived in complete obedience to the Lord God himself. Well, let's begin first with the person's conduct. The true worshiper is the one whose conduct reflects obedience to God's word. True worship begins with a transformed life. Notice verses one and two, or verses two and three. David says, He who walks blamelessly and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. And as three puts it, who d- he does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. I love these two verses um, knitted together here because you'll see carefully how verse three is actually a reflection of verse two, only given in the reverse. Verse two addresses the person's conduct from a positive perspective, while verse three then addresses it from a negative perspective. And this is because verses two and three form what is called a chiastic structure in the Hebrew. And that's all just to say that the author uses these particular words and phrases one way. And then after reflecting on those verses, he reverses it to just give a heightened understanding of what those original verses meant. And again, it's in the center of those two verses that the author drives the point home. Here, David speaks of the aspect of our conduct positively in verse 2, and then he rewords them negatively in verse 3 to reinforce this answer of who is qualified to come before God. In a chiastic structure here, the emphasis is usually on the second and the third phrases. And in verses 2 and 3, God narrows that focus to our conduct from how we walk to what's really going on in the heart. And that's the point of David's words here. And again, he then drives the point home by saying, your walk, your work, your words should be the evidence of a transformed life. David puts it this way in verse 2, one who walks blamelessly and with integrity and who works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. First, the righteous man's walk. He who walks blamelessly. This has to do with the conduct or the quality of one's life before others. The word here is for blameless is the same word from which we get integrity. We're not talking about perfection here. We're talking about a conduct. We're talking about a pattern. And we're talking about integrity. What David is saying here is that our life ought to be a walk of integrity, should it not? One that is characterized by moral integrity. The quality of being honest and having moral uprightness. To not be accused of any wrongdoing, but instead to be an example to others. In other words, this is the kind of quality that ought to be consistent, consistently descriptive of a true worshiper. A true worshiper is someone who has integrity both in their relationship to God and their relationship to others. It's this kind of blamelessness that finds expression in a righteous and faithful lifestyle. There's consistency to the worshiper's expression of faith. Ultimately, this is the kind of true worship that must begin in the heart. It can't be demonstrated on the outside without having the inside transformed. And from the heart, it expresses a lifestyle that is pleasing to God, appropriate to God. When the God looks down and says, this is a man or woman after my own heart. If God is the priority of one's life, then it it ought to show itself in our obedience and faithfulness to God's word. To put it another way, if my life isn't right with God, then how can I expect to be a righteous example to others? And the point is this, how can we expect to receive God's blessing if we are deliberately disobeying him? No doubt David had this in mind when he contemplated the fear of the Lord for three months. 
I want you to notice how it practically applies to our relationships at the end of verse 3. David says, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend. The phrase here, take up a reproach, is a Hebrew idiom that means to cast a slur. The believer who seeks to worship God properly will never discredit his neighbor, never cast a slur against them. Instead, he lifts others up and maintains the utmost integrity in all that he does. When Uzzah died, David should have said to everybody around him, we have sinned against God, rather than showing anger. Why? Because this is how a true worshiper ought to conduct his life. Paul actually puts it this way in Philippians chapter 2, verses 13, or 14 and 15. And notice carefully what Paul says, and carefully in light of what David wrote. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Why? So that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. That's a true worshiper. God's people are his lights to an unbelieving world, are we not? We are called to reflect the light of Christ to an unbelieving world. And the point is this, our life ought to be a living testimony of our obedience and love for God as an example to others. Not to join with the world in casting slurs, grumbling, complaining, but to giving praise to God and for reminding people how holy God is. To live as David learned to live in the fear of the Lord. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. If we're deliberately causing others to question God in terms of his character, who are we then to come and approach God and worship him? David says we must examine our walk before God. And when we do this, our work will be examined as well. And that's the other part of our conduct, not just our, our walk, but our work. Notice the very next phrase is in verses 2. Um, works righteousness. And then look over at the negative in verse 3, nor does evil to his neighbor. A true worshiper is one who doesn't just live a blameless life. He proactively works righteousness before his neighbor. Righteousness is another synonym for blameless. And here it's the righteous person who practices what he knows to be true and right and lives in conformity with that practice. This word works, again, is an action word. It's moral integrity expressed in right actions. It's the person who, when faced with a moral decision, has determined to do what is the right thing to do, not the expedient thing to do. He does what is right before God, period. And he keeps his conscience clear. He maintains his moral integrity. His actions are consistent with God's word. And it's this word for evil in verse 3 that could be translated misery, distress, injury, and wickedness that David is trying to avoid. It applies generally to two areas of a person's life, both to his character and to his thinking. Here, David, what David is saying is that in contrast to the unbeliever, the one who is approved of God, obeys, is mindful and wise in what he says and what he does. But the one who is not approved before God disobeys God and lives a life of rebellion against God. David says it's, that is not the conduct of a true worshiper. A redeemed man is one who lives his life in conformity with God's revealed will. So no doubt there was a lot of repenting that David did in those three months after Uzzah had died and God showed his wrath and judgment. Again, this is the kind of person that David wanted to be. And we know that because he wrote so many Psalms expressing that. And there's no doubt that David was very aware, again, of his own shortcomings before God. And this is why then he was also so keenly aware of God's forgiveness after of his own sin 
He was a man who had a heart after God's own heart. And after addressing his walk and his work, David finally drives the point home. Why? Because this ultimately has to do with our words. And words are what come out of the heart. David should have not expressed anger at that moment. Because he knew that a person's walk, their work, their words, all reflected what was in the heart. A man whose heart is right after God does what? Again, look at the end of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3. He speaks truth in his heart. He speaks truth. David, you knew that you weren't supposed to carry the ark up. You knew that from the high priests. You knew that from what you knew of the scriptures. You knew that once Uzzah died, you shouldn't have had this outburst of anger. You should have spoke truth in your heart. And then he goes on to say he does not slander with his tongue. The third and final aspect of examining our conduct reveals the relationship between what is in the heart to what comes out of the mouth. The principle here is this simple. A righteous man is one whose heart is right with God and does not slander or gossip with his tongue. He keeps his tongue in check. His words are under his control. And if you remember back to 2 Samuel chapter 6 and the incident with the ark, David then lashed out in anger against God for what God did in putting Uzzah to death. He should have never done that. But then he immediately recognized his fear of the Lord. Unlike the wicked, he immediately recognized his own sinful behavior. And listen to how the scripture describes the mouth of the wicked. This again comes from a psalm of David. Psalm 5 verse 9. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave and they flatter with their tongue. No doubt David said, that is not the man that I want to be. That is not the man God approves to worship. Again, the portrait that David is painting for us here is that the one who is approved of God, the one who recognizes God, recognizes his own sinful behavior and is repentant and then seeks to live righteously before God. It's not what's on the outside that honors God. It's what, it's what is the condition of the heart that truly honors the Lord. And this is why David then prayed in Psalm 26 too, Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and test my heart. Why? Because God's judgment and discipline is against those who do not know God. Well, not only does the portrait of the true worshiper apply to one's character, but it extends to the company that we keep as well. To put it another way, it applies to the relationships that we have with one another. In other words, in verse 4, David compels us to examine the company that we keep. How are we to relate to others if we are to go and worship the Lord's temple? Verse 4 says, In whose eyes a reprobate is is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. You know as a Christian we are hated by the world if we love Christ. Once again, David knew that if he lived righteously, he would be despised by the reprobate. But in whose company are worshipers, there would be delight, there would be joy, there would be celebration. A reprobate here can be translated as a vile man. This is the kind of man who's vile and corrupt on the inside because of the wickedness of his own heart. And David says, this is the kind of person who is worthless, polluted, dirty, morally depraved, and that is not me. Or at least I don't want to be that person. In stark contrast, the righteous are clean. The true worshiper honors those who fear Yahweh. And the end of verse 4 says, and he swears to his own hurt and does not change. Now, I have to say before you today, these are, these are very difficult verses to translate because literally the text reads this way. He swears to do evil and does not change. But contextually, there is a reason why David says this. A literal translation seems to be describing a wicked person here. However, the personal pronoun, he pulls this verse 
back to verse 1 and 2. And again, the person that we're talking about here is ultimately the one who seeks to worship God. And so, David, what are you saying here? Well, this is the point of verse 4. A righteous man is someone who keeps his word, even if it brings injury to himself. When he promises to keep his word, he makes a vow. He swears by it. And then he remains true to his word, even if in the end it brings injury or, or injury to himself. His integrity drives him to hold fast his commitments, to hold fast no matter the cost. He keeps his word even if it means personal loss, personal pain. And no doubt, David felt a lot of pain. Again, the one who has a heart after God's own heart will surround himself with those who fear Yahweh. This is the kind of person he chooses to be. A true worshiper doesn't just have Again, the right conduct in the right company. But it goes even further. Thirdly, he knows how to handle his own currency. And this is the first part of verse 5. Very simply. In other words, how are you handling the money and the resources, the stewardship that God has given you to take care of the things that ultimately belong to him? Two things that characterize the true worshiper and how he handles his finances. First of all, he doesn't put his money out for interest. And nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He's intentionally a good and faithful steward of the resources that God has given him. And again, according to the law of Moses, which David knew, an Israelite was never to take advantage of his fellow Israelite who had fallen down on troubled times. And yet through Israel's history, often the poor would be taken to court, taken advantage of by the wealthy and by those who could easily afford to pay a bribe in order to thwart justice. They would work the system in order to gain the advantage over others. And bribery was strictly a practice that was prohibited by God. A righteous man would never let the personal, the potential of personal gain influence in, how, in these matters of principle and how one ought to worship. And no doubt David felt destitute at that moment. Again, here David says the true worshiper does not seek the advantage of someone else's ex at someone else's expense. He's a man who demonstrates financial integrity in the exercise of his resources toward others. The true worshiper is one who works for the benefit of others. And let me be clear here. In terms of our practical holiness, our finances reveal most, conclu most clearly what we truly value with our heart. As one Christian writer once said, if you want to know about a person's spiritual life, just ask to open their checkbook and you'll know what they truly treasure in their heart. The true worshiper here, David says, treasures God above all else. He puts God first, and that desire is reflective of their whole life. Again, he sees his life as a steward of God's belongings, God's treasures. And that desire is then reflective in his whole life. Not just when it comes to giving and offering, but when it comes to living your whole life as an example to others. Well, after the plea and the portrait, the psalm ends with this wonderful promise. It's the final sentence of verse 5. The one who truly worships God in respect to their conduct, their company, and their currency, this is the one whom God promises to keep secure. And I love the fact that David ends the psalm this way. Here is God's solemn promise to the true worshiper. He who does these things will what? They will never be shaken. And you might want to underline, highlight that word never. The true worshiper will never be shaken by life circumstances. Never be shaken by the trials and the temptations that come into our life. Not that they won't trip up. Not that they won't fail in their weaknesses, but it will never take them out of the race. 
Through the storm, though the storms of life may come, the righteous man will always be like the wise man who built his house upon a what? The rock. And the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when the rains come and they slam against their house, Jesus said, it will, the house will never fall. Difficulties and trials will come. But as one commentator said, the person may be shaken, but they will never be shaken loose from God. And that's the promise that David gives here. The bottom line is this, the righteous will abide and dwell in God's complete security. And that then begs the question once again, what are we to make of our own worship? How are we to know that our worship is approved of God? Well, let me close with this very simple illustration and analogy to bring it all home to you. Donald Gray Barnhouse, this wonderful theologian, gave this great illustration of a time when, he, when a family, seeing this large sign along the road, um, along the highway, told them that they needed to go and worship in a church of their own choice. He said one of the children read the sign and said to the father, Daddy, what does worship mean? The father replied, it means to go to church and to listen to the preacher preach. I am so thankful for Donald Gray Barnhouse in this illustration because Barnhouse thought to himself and he said, what a horrible definition of worship. Worship is not about the place. Worship is not about the preacher. Worship, though, is about a person. And who is that person? None other than God himself. That is David's focus here. It is on who God is. What God requires. What God demands. How holy he is. But how gracious, forgiving, and loving he is as well. Barnhouse said worship 400 years ago was pronounced worth-ship. Worth-ship. And so worship, he said, has everything to do with the worth of God and not about the place that we go. True worship is not about us. It's about the person of God revealed in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? And so before we come to him in worship, let us remind ourselves that if God is truly worthy of our worship, it will be first and foremost reflected in the conduct of who we are, the company that we keep, and ultimately the stewardship that God has given us. Otherwise, it won't make any difference what the preacher preaches. As we go before the Lord's table, I'd like to ask the men to come forward, but I want to take a moment and just pray to just thank the Lord for his goodness and grace in our lives. And so men, if you can come forward, let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we are sobered to think that when we come before your presence, we come needing to have our hearts clean, needing to understand what your righteous requirement is. But Lord, when we understand that, we understand likewise how wonderful, loving, gracious, forgiving you are. We know that sin will be punished. Sinners will incur, incur the wrath of God. And discipline will come to those who love you and are called according to your purpose. As the writer of Hebrews reminds us, what son is not disciplined? And so we understand that in coming before you, we must confess our sin. We must acknowledge where we fall woefully short and agree with you and confess our sins. Why? Because you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you for the rich joy that we have of being able to worship you, but it's not because of who we are. It's because of what Christ has done. 
We thank you that because of how worthy Christ is, how righteous, how perfect the Son of God was and is and forever will be, because of him, we now have access to you. So Lord, as we think about what it means to come before your table, we are reminded both that this is a solemn time as well as a joyful celebration, but one that we love and cherish because of the worth of who you are. Lord, help us to be reminded of this in the conduct of our day, in the company that we keep, and of the money and the stewardship and the things that we own, that, Lord, every aspect of our life would reflect wholly our integrity to be a man or woman who has a heart after you. And I pray that having done that, Lord, we will come to the mountain. We will come before you and sing your praises and joyfully rejoice that when that time comes for us to die and to stand before you, we will be glorified for we will see you as you really are. We thank you for this time in your word. Pray that you would take your word, lodge it deep in our hearts, apply it to our lives so that we can walk in a manner worthy of your calling and be lights to an unbelieving world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.